playing with your food. That's the mark of a maker. The KitchenAid stand mixer and attachments. Hello and welcome everybody to the British Library Knowledge Centre and this food season event. My name is Polly Russell and I'm the founder and the curator for the food season. I work very closely with guest directors Angela Clutton and Melissa Thompson. This is the fifth food season that we've run, very generously sponsored by KitchenAid. The last two years have been online, so it is absolutely fantastic to have you all here in person. So that is really exciting. Brilliant. But it is also lovely to be able to welcome in our hybrid world those people who are joining us remotely. So hello everyone who's being, uh, who we are being beamed out to as well. Uh, the food season uh, is all about food, which of course you will know is the very best subject in the entire world. And in the food season we try and cover everything from food politics, we're doing food in prisons, we're doing lives in food. So we have Ainsley Harriet, Angela Hartnett coming up. And next week, I just want to draw your attention to a fabulous event a week today, which is with uh, the two authors, Sarah Winman and Kate Young, talking about food in fiction. Kate did an event last year. It was electrifying and wonderful. So do look at the whole food season and think about coming to more. Tonight, though, is a real treat. Like, what an honour to have this panel together talking about food in jeopardy, food in danger, all through Dan's phenomenal book, Eating to Extinction, which is absolutely wonderful. Yes, woo! Completely amazing. So this event is really a treat because we have Dan here, Jessica Harris, who is in her own right, an amazing legend, a professor, the author and editor of 18 books, including High on the Hog, which many of you may have seen was uh, serialized on Netflix. She is a scholar and a historian of African food diasporas. Her work is political, it is urgent, it is important, it is brilliant. She is the author of this book. And she did an event for us last week we sold out of all of her books except for three. So there are three of these books downstairs which you can get hold of if you are very lucky. We have also got here tonight Joe Schneider. Joe Schneider is American from New York by birth but has very much relocated here and is the master cheesemaker of Stitchelton, which anyone who knows is the superior in the style of Stilton cheese. That's controversial but I think it is true. Uh, we also have the wonderful Tom Oliver but you can see he is not here with us in person. He is being beamed in because he is testing positive for COVID. However, fear not, his peri is here and you will be able to taste it because he sent it ahead, so that is great news. So the way that this event is going to run, um, Jessica is going to be chairing, she's going to be talking to the panelists for about 45 minutes, 50 minutes, then there will be plenty of time for audience questions, so please do think of questions that you would like to ask. Um, then we will be going back out into the foyer and that will be an opportunity to taste Tom's wonderful Perry and Joe's fantastic Stitchelton. It will also be an opportunity to try and snag those three books of these and also some of Dan's book and both I'm sure Dan and Jessica will be happy to do some signings. That is it from me. Over to you, Jessica. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you all for coming this evening. Um, I know that Dan has his uh, plaque, if I may, in the audience, but I'm assuming that many of you may know Dan by voice, but not necessarily by face, because out of the 25 years that he's been at the BBC, 15 of them, he has spent on the food program. Uh, Dan and I know each other for probably 10 of those 15 years. He thinks we met in Atlanta airport. I disagree. <laughs> I uh, suspect he's wrong and that we either met at Oxford at one of the uh, Oxford Cultural Collective events or in New Orleans. Mm. I do know that we bonded in New Orleans and we bonded in the city that is one of my cities where 
the major conversation at lunch is what you're going to have for dinner and where you're going to have it. We bonded on the bayou, talking about food and having an incredible meal prepared by a matriarch of Cajun cooking with really shrimp boats outside on the bayou in front of her house where she was serving us this amazing lunch. We bonded as he slid down a mile high pile of raw sugar at a sugar plantation. So we've had a few adventures together. Um, but what I want to do now is, um, and I don't know that you know, Dan, a lot of this book is about the um, slow food arc of taste and some of the items that have been saved, if you will, on it. I was on the Slow Food Arc of Taste committee in the US early on in, in its uh, inception, or I at didn't its know inception. That. Mm. Didn't think you did. <laughs> and there was a lady on it named Poppy Tooker. I, you may know Poppy. Yeah, yeah I do. But she coined the phrase, eat it to save it. Mm -hmm. And she said it's what her grandmother used to say. You have to eat it to save it. If you don't eat it, if you don't use it, if you don't appreciate it, if you don't consume it, it will go away. Mm. So Thank it's you. another end of the eating to extinction. Um, most recently, I saw Dan in Belfast, and we literally both have flown back from Belfast this morning, which is why I'm a little loopy. Um, and we, um, we were participants at a gastronomy summit given by the University of Ulster in collaboration with a number of people, including the Oxford Cultural Collective. And um, there, he did an amazing presentation on basically eating to extinction. And there was a PowerPoint in it. And I know he wasn't expected to do a PowerPoint here, but I did ask him if he would share a little bit of it with us, because I think it, more than anything else, can calibrate our discussion and begin to get us talking about some of those things. So please, Dan, if you will. Great. Thanks. And uh, very pleased to do a PowerPoint, because I think uh, at, some, at one point, I did imagine that there would be pictures in the book but the publisher was determined it was just going to be text. And so this is my opportunity to uh, illustrate the stories with some of the pictures. So I know uh, people who've hopefully been reading the book have images in their minds of some of the stories and the characters, but here you actually get to, uh, to see them. So uh, and thank you, Jessica. Um, again, amazing experiences uh, with you in uh, New Orleans and also for helping in uh, one of the uh, important chapters in the book. And also great to be here at the uh, British Library as well because there are chapters that wouldn't exist in the book without the British Library. So where else can you find obscure books on 19th century Japanese uh, food culture? Um, yeah, but the uh, <laughs> British Library. So I, I just want to um, just uh, spend about 15 minutes explaining the, uh, yeah, the, the, the genesis of the book really, uh, how it came to be. Um, what I thought it was going to be, and then what it turned out to be. Um, and Jessica's mentioned already one of the important um, features, which is the arc of taste. Uh, so, and also Jessica's mentioned that 15 years on the food program uh, is, is at the, uh, the core of the book, really, because it, that enabled me to find stories and travel and meet people who uh, populate the book. But in 2007, when I joined the food program, I, um, when they asked me which, which program, which story would you like to start with, and because of my background and my, my father's from southwest Sicily, I said, well, you know, the citrus harvest is on in Sicily right now. Please, can I go? And um, they kindly said, yes, there isn't a huge amount of travel, so I think I lucked out with my first request there. But it, it took me to uh, not where my, my roots are, my family's roots are, which is in the southwest, but in the east. And you can see Etna there on, the, uh, on your left. And I'd arrived there to watch the harvest of the blood oranges in February and think <coughs> that this is going to be a, a really celebratory program. But I was, I was there meeting farmers who were telling me that it was their last harvest, that they were going to leave their fruit on the trees the following year because the economics were no longer working out, that this fruit that had shaped their identities, that had uh, transformed the landscape of the island for a thousand years, that uh, had provided an important source of income and jobs 
was disappearing for small-scale farmers as, as um, vast um, areas of uh, Spain and North Africa were turning over to citrus and out-competing them. And I went to this meal, uh, you can see there, um, with the farmers and the local uh, activists who were trying to work with the farmers to save the citrus. And it was at this meal, and there were five courses at this meal, each one featured the blood orange as an ingredient. And I sat uh, next to somebody who had travelled down from the town of uh, uh, Bra in uh, Piedmont, in the north of Italy. And they explained that they thought that these oranges should be included onto the Ark of Taste, which I had no idea what that was. It was the Noah's Ark of Taste. And it, quite simply, is an online catalogue in which people around the world are able to submit their endangered foods. In other words, foods that they care about from where they live um, in the world. Foods that are disappearing. Perhaps they were uh, the foods that um, their ancestors had uh, played some part in developing and creating. And uh, these, this, it could be seeds, it could be skills and knowledge and flavors. Uh, and there, I, I realized it was, this was a gateway to, uh, you know, as a journalist, a gateway to the treasure trove of stories. Five and a half thousand products that had been nominated from people around the world from you know, 150 different countries. And for, I would admit, for many years, it, that was what the Ark of Taste uh, was for me. It was, a, it was a place to go in which you could find a food that would take you to a part of the world and a people, you know, a community, uh, some history. You know, why did that food exist in the first place? Um, who, who was um, dependent on this food? How did it come to be? And what was the story of human ingenuity about how did they figure out how to do that? Or why is it that it tastes that, that why does it have that particular taste? So I, I, um, I spent years recording these stories, but not really, I think, joining the dots. And it was when I started to write um, Eating to Extinction in um, 2017, 2018, that I was forced to, to, to join the dots and come up with a narrative of um, what joined these thousands of stories together? What had happened in the world to leave so many foods, um, plants, animal breeds, skills, knowledge at risk of extinction? It's a big, complicated story. Um, it takes me more than 400 pages to, to tell the story. But um, I just want to use some of the specific stories in the book to, to explain what I discovered that I, I feel that I wanted to try and get across to a, 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 my, you know, the readers of the book and to as many people as possible. One issue that we are increasingly familiar with is, is monocultures. So um, I, was, I met farmers from uh, Uganda who were trying to save one of their 50-odd varieties of banana. And again, they were telling me stories of certain types of bananas that were used as carbohydrate in dishes. Uh, bananas that were used um, to brew beer that would be offered at weddings, uh, marriage ceremonies. So difficult to make that it was an uh, uh, illustration of the commitment uh, a groom had towards his future bride. <clears throat> and then I realized that actually, you know, 1,500 different banana varieties that had been documented around the world, and yet the world traded and grew in monocultures just one one banana, which today is the Cavendish, before it had been the Gros Michel. And the reason why those names are important is because uh, the Gros Michel had been the globally traded banana, but it, it became overwhelmed by a fungal disease in, by the 1950s and had been replaced as, um, as the globally traded banana by another, a ca the Cavendish. And because of the way bananas grow, um, they're more like herbs than, they're not trees, they're Kind of her they're like herbs, and you can propagate them from the roots, so they are genetically uh, pretty much uniform. Um, that uh, the, the Gros Michel had been overcome by this disease, and now the Cavendish was becoming overwhelmed by this fungal disease that had originated in the center of origin, the center of diversity of the banana. So thousands, possibly millions of years ago, wild bananas were, uh, had co-evolved with fungal diseases and in an evolutionary process 
um, were basically moving through time. Um, you know, at some point the fungal disease would mutate, and then the, the you know the, the wild banana genetics would then find a defence mechanism against that, and that's how it plays out. But with a monoculture, we take the plant out of the evolutionary process, and we leave it. Um, we 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 um, yeah cause it to become vulnerable, and that's exactly what's happening right now. So already I'd realised that some of these foods that people were trying to save weren't just quaint traditions. They were resources that we would need for the future because the guy you see here, who on um, social media you can track down as Banana Man or Super Banana Man, <laughs> he works in labs in the Netherlands um, at a university in which he is going back to the centre of origin of the banana and finding the genetics that have been bred out of the um, monoculture bananas, you know, the Cavendish particularly, to bring back the kinds of traits that it, we will need that crop to have um, in the future because, again, it's just become so vulnerable. This idea of vulnerability and lack of diversity in the food system isn't new. So 100 years ago, uh, Nikolai Vavilov, uh, a Russian botanist, dedicated his life to travelling around the world saving seeds and bringing them back uh, and creating a seed bank in which they would be stored, believing that what he was collecting from five continents was a resource that would uh, prevent humanity or people all around the world, uh, prevent them from starving to death because he, he realised that future crops needed diversity. And in, in the seeds he was collecting, he, he believed he had the, you know, the, the, the keys to the, to the future of uh, global food security. Um, Unfortunately, Nikolai Vavilov fell out with uh, a favour with Stalin in the 1930s and, and, and um, died in a prison of the very thing he was trying to prevent, which was starvation. Meanwhile, the people who had uh, been inspired by him and had followed him to work in his seed bank in St. Petersburg, many of them also died of starvation as the seeds were surrounded by the Nazis during the siege of Leningrad, and although some of them were surrounded by ripe samples of rice that they could consume, they believed this was a resource too important to eat, and so they effectively sacrificed themselves. Meanwhile, later in the, uh, uh, well, at the, at the midpoint of the 20th century, another scientist is also highly, you know, is, is really worried about future food security, but has a different approach. So whereas Vavilov was interested in diversity and saving seeds. Norman Borlaug was on a mission to try and create crops that could feed the world. And one of the things that he stumbled on across were genetics from certain um, types of wheat uh, that could create high yielding, really productive strains of wheat that could benefit from some of the other technological breakthroughs in the 20th century, like artificial fertilizer, for example, irrigation systems. And so Borlaug who was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970, uh, came up with a type of wheat that quickly proved that it could produce huge amounts of calories, more calories than any wheat that had come before, and so successful that it spread around the world. Uh, it starts off in Mexico and ends up in Bangladesh and India and then throughout Europe. And so today, a, a wheat farmer in, in Europe will be offered around... 10 types of wheat to grow. Uh, it's, it's the so-called recommended list that's shaped by millers and uh, the food industry. Whereas in this um, seed vault in the Arctic Circle, as you can see, there are more than 200,000 individual samples of wheat collected from around the world, showing how much diversity there is out there in terms of how they look, how they taste, how they grow, uh, the types of soils they can grow in, the kinds, the types of heat conditions or drought that they might be able to tolerate. And choose any crop. That, that diversity exists uh, because your ancestors and my ancestors uh, saved these seeds where they were on the planet. These seeds and these crops had adapted to the local conditions. And so um, scientists who believe, like Vavilov did, that we need them for the future, have stored them away in this seed vault, um, funded mostly by the Norwegian government, hugely inspired by the work of Vavilov and others who followed him. But I wasn't just interested in the 
disappearing genetics and what that meant for the food system. And uh, I think we're, we're becoming aware that the war in Ukraine um, is showing us how lacking in resilience the food system has. So a third of the world's globally traded wheat coming from the um, Black Sea region, huge amounts of the world's fertilizers that underpin the Green Revolution system that Norman Borlaug was part of. They come from Belarus and Russia. And so we've created uh, <laughs> an effect, you know, a really productive system, but one that's fragile, extremely vulnerable. But it wasn't just genetic resources, as I said. I, I was also interested in our story, the story of humans and skills and knowledge in our relationship with nature and how that had changed over time. And I was drawing here on an experience I had in making uh, a radio program with the Hadza hunter-gatherers who live around Lake Iasi in uh, East Africa, in Tanzania. Um, around 1,000 members of the tribe are left. 200 of which practice no form of agriculture. They are thoroughly modern human beings who are opting to um, continue a lifestyle that to date is the most successful lifestyle any uh, human um, population uh, ha has come up with. So, you know, 12,000 years, 10,000 years of agriculture, um, 300,000 years homo, you know, homo sapiens, perhaps two, two million years of our human ancestors living as hunter-gatherers. and they live in the place where you find some of the um, earlier, you know, the oldest human footsteps um, uh, archaeologists have discovered and, and huge, uh, you know, amazing archaeological finds as well that tell our story uh, as Homo sapiens. Why should we be interested in the Hadza? Um, they are modern human beings and are a proxy for um, prehistoric humans. Well, there are... Um, <laughs> skills that they have that could be disappearing in our lifetimes. So um, their number one favorite food is honey, high energy carbohydrate. It's full of wriggling larvae, crunchy bees. Um, and you know, so it's high energy carbohydrate, high protein as well. It could be that honey is one of the foods, the mo one of the most important foods that made us human. To find honey, is, it's a huge effort by the Hadza, and they, they could uh, climb up baobab tree after baobab tree with no luck. L over perhaps 700,000 years or a million years, um, there has been a collaboration between humans and a particular bird, um, the honey guide, scientific name indicator indicator. So the, the Hadza will, cr will um, do a particular whistle that the bird will recognize, will swoop down, will lead the Hadza to the tree where the honey is, and the, the Hadza can then use smoke to get access to the honey, throw that down to the fellow uh, hunter-gatherers, and the, um, the honey guide will be left with some wax. That, that's the thing that it really wants, but it's too dangerous for it to approach the bee's nest. Uh, 700,000 years of this collaboration that could be disappearing in our lifetimes because when I was there, I mean, I, I, there were huts that had been created in which... Um, sweet sugary drinks had been imported from other parts of the world and their world was being encroached upon by all kinds of pressures. Um, it's our story and it is part of the big human story and I think we should reflect on that. But more importantly, it also shows us, because the scientists are increasingly um, interested, as you might be aware of the gut microbiome, the fact that the more diverse our diets, the more diverse the microbes in our guts, the more beneficial that is for our health, physical and mental. Um, and so um, huge diversity found in the Hadza's diet, 800 potentially a menu of um, 800 different plants and animal species. Meanwhile, when archaeologists dig up bog bodies that have been very well preserved um, and can look at the food and, um, that's found inside the guts, uh, again, huge diversity is part of you know, our evolution, and I don't know, if, try and count up <laughs> how many different plant and animal species um, you consume. It will be nowhere near what the Hadza have or perhaps what um, Tolland man was eating uh, in the 4th century BCE. We are also aware, because of the pandemic we've been through, of the risks um, of humans encroaching on the wild and the interaction between the wild and urban areas <clears throat> and we're still obviously trying to find some of the details in terms of what caused the outbreak. But we know in other 
cases earlier in this century. Malaysia, for example, that they started to deforest. They put pig farms into areas where it, it had been wild. Fruit bats came and interacted with the pigs, and it caused Nipah virus, which is far more deadly than COVID. Uh, people died, and Malaysia lost a pig industry, a pork industry. <clears throat> so this is a very, you know, this is a very serious issue about the, the another form of um, diversity being lost, that wild diversity. And there are things that we as humans have survived on um, that are disappearing, close to extinction, that we don't even understand how they work and how um, pe uh, cultures in different parts of the world um, interacted with plants in such a way that we are still yet to fully understand. One example is in uh, Oaxaca, close to where maize was domesticated around 7,000 years ago. Um, scientists, botanists, were going into uh, this remote village in the late 70s and stumbled across a most strange plant. It was a 16-foot uh, tall um, type of maize that shouldn't have been growing there because the soil was so poor. More, more bizarre was that it was dripping this mucus. And decades went by, and they couldn't figure out what this plant was or what was happening. So new techniques, new analytical techniques, uh, about four years ago, allowed some uh, American scientists to analyze what was going on in this dripping mucus from these aerial roots that the, this type of maize was growing. Turns out there is a microbial community, uh, millions of different species interacting with the sugars being released by the plant. Um, taking nitrogen from the air and fertilizing the plant. It's a self-fertilizing type of grain, cereal crop, which, again, that was mind-blowing for scientists working in that field. Again, we are losing plants and agricultural crops that we don't even understand how they work, but also they have the potential. Uh, you know, this is a type of plant that there might be some application in the future in which we can reduce our, our dependence on artificial fertilizer if we can um, develop um, the science of understanding how this works further. I mean, and there are issues attached to that, obviously, because this is a plant that has been protected and saved by an indigenous uh, population for thousands of years. And now Western scientists have come into the community, uh, Mars, Corporation is involved in some of the research as well. Extremely complicated. You know, who, who does this belong to? Meanwhile, in Europe, um, likewise, there has been a revolution in the types of foods and businesses that, that um, have been based around uh, what I would describe as endangered food. So in the uh, Swabian Jura, in southern Germany, again, quite a, um, a, a very tough place to farm, but for thousands of years, people settled there and survived because of the most humble of ingredients, uh, a particular type of lentil that was adapted to the soils and con the conditions in southern Germany. And um, in the 1960s, uh, as Germany was industrializing, people were leaving the land, diets were changing, Canada had become the world's biggest uh, producer of lentils. Uh, they lost this food that had been part of their history. Not many people cared at the time, but this guy did, uh, Wold Mammel, uh, who is a, a farmer who spent years trying to find the seeds to bring that crop back. And he, he wrote to every single seed bank in the world and traveled to, in search of um, this lost lentil that he believed was not just part of an agricultural system, it was in fact a, a, you know, part of a way of life, uh, a part of an agricultural system of rotation of crops that were fertilizing the soil and feeding his community. And he mourned the loss of this lentil to the point where he actually traveled to Russia, to the seed bank that I mentioned earlier, created by Vavilov. And here he is. Um, he found his lentil. <laughs> um, it had been uh, mislabeled, you know, and, and he'd, he'd gone through the records. But again, the power, the power of uh, uh, our relationship with food and the way it can um, give identity and a, and a sense of... Um, cohesion in a community. Uh, his story was so 
inspirational that people in Sweden started to ask, well, what did we have in terms of beans and peas, these most humble of ingredients? And they looked back through um, some of the earliest recorded um, uh, records of, of you know, what had been farmed over centuries, and they brought back some of their um, beans. Uh, and, and then their story, in turn, inspired uh, three people in the east of England, who were thinking about what the future of food in Britain should be. And that then led to a, a company which you might be familiar with, Hodmedods. So again, from this, suede, you know, this obscure southern German lentil to what is now a thriving business that's reviving um, fava beans that they realised in their research had been grown in Britain during the Iron Age. And the whole I mean, the big idea really in, in eating to extinction is that we all had our Swabian lentil or we all had, you know, a food that was so well adapted to the environment in which we live. In Orkney, for example, it's a type of barley um, that uh, whereas some crops can grow very well if you put enough fertiliser and chemicals um, into the soil, but there's a type of barley called, they call bear, bear barley on, on Orkney that it, it's the harsh conditions, it... Um, uh, it's adapted to and it can grow and so where, where all other food crops fail in a really really tough winter bear barley um, uh, can produ always produces and not only that you know it, it has an, an amazing um, mineral content as well so there's a nutrient profile that people are looking into in terms of the as, as you can see here levels of copper magnesium and and zinc a food that that disappeared in the past that could be part of their future. And in fact, the Scottish government is investing in bringing back these so-called land race crops. There are natural resources that we've lost. So when we think about the idea of um, Victorian London and the world of Dickens in which the oyster was the McDonald's of its day, uh, but pollution and overconsumption and um, yeah, the, the way in which um, that, that ecosystem was exploited led to the extinction of, um, in, in many parts of our coastline, of the, of the native flat um, oyster. That's disappeared pretty much from our waters. It still exists in pockets uh, of Europe, including the west coast of um, Denmark. And they've turned this into a, a resource in which they are telling people the story. And people are going on oyster safaris to actually learn about this um, almost ex you know, near extinct, um, in, in other parts of Europe, this resource that, that was so abundant uh, just 100 years ago. Um, but just to finish off, um, I also in the book wanted to get to the places that, that, were the, that provided the origin story of our food. So I mentioned uh, maize in southern Mexico. Uh, I travelled to China you know, to, in search of the place where um, hunter-gatherers domesticated wild grasses that gave us rice. And likewise, I went into the um, eastern Turkey to look at where hunter-gatherers 12,000 years ago became the very first farmers, and they took these wild grasses and gave us wheat and barley. And when they did that, they created two main species of wheat. One was iron corn, one was called emma. And emma's interesting because it's the wheat that for thousands of years fed most human civilization. So it's, emma is the wheat that uh, the people who built the pyramids were farming and, and eating. Likewise, the people who erected Stonehenge were emma farmers. But um, emma starts to fall out of favor as um, bread wheats take root and are spread around the world. And particularly after the Green Revolution and Borlaug's high-yielding wheat, they, they completely disappear in most parts of the world. However, in this village that I visited in Turkey, there were farmers who were, and, who were growing and millers still milling this ancient type of wheat. And um, why does it matter that they save this wheat? Well, for them, it's um, an emotional connection they have. They love the look of the wheat as it's growing in the fields. They love the smell of the wheat as it's being cooked into what you have here as a pilaf dish with some uh, goose. Um, and to them, it's like medicine. It, it actually, this is a, we don't really associate wheat with flavor. You know, it's, um, but for them, it, it has a very, very powerful, um, yeah, a, a economic, agricultural, cultural, um, and, and nutritional uh, you know, benefit to them, uh, but very few of them are growing it. Luckily, there are chefs in the, 
in, in Istanbul, for example, who are supporting them and helping them bring back uh, these ancient um, resources. And when, when you look, think about that in the context of um, climate change and some of the commitments that, that, have been, that were made at COP26, and also the issues we now have where we're scratching our heads thinking where, where, what is going to be our energy strategy and all the gas that's then used to make artificial fertilisers, it could be that some of the stories, some of the foods from the past could be clues as to where we need to go next for the future. So for thousands of years, humans did produce food in greater harmony with nature. And it could be with the use of modern science and technology that we can, we can start to unpick and understand some of these indigenous complex food systems and make use of them. Um, and so I think this is why I wanted to write the book, and this is why I think people like Jessica Harris and, and, and others are important because they, they tell stories that engage people and make them realise what we have lost and what we need to save. Um, I'm not arguing that these are foods that will feed the world, but I'm arguing that a better food system is one in which these foods are no longer endangered and at risk of extinction. Thank you, Dan. Um, now, I had a question, but I think I'm going to skip it. Mm. I'm going to go straight into these two gentlemen who are sitting here, <laughs> probably a bit nervous if they're like me, um, getting ready to go on. And I want to start with you, Tom, but before I go on, I just want to read this because I think this is lovely. Lighter than wine, more elegant than cider, a good peri might be honey-colored with the lush, musky fragrance of a damp autumnal forest, or an old-fashioned sweet shop. A sip will fill your mouth with the bittersweet taste of ripening orchard fruit, tinged with the acid of lemon drops, the bone-dry tannins of tea leaves, and the sugar of candy floss. Perry captured the essence of a place. I think that's a beautiful way to get into our discussion of Perry and how, how Perry is being brought back by Tom Oliver, who was the tour manager for, I've got it written down the here, Proclaimers, the Proclaimers <laughs> which is another way of saying he knows how to wrangle cats. But <laughs> there it is. And so, can I just say, he, so he is in the book, Jessica, and, 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 and so is... Uh, Joe, because they are the people who are out there saving these foods. So I was only able to include these stories in the book because there was somebody out there to welcome me, in, welcome me into their world and say they were saving these foods. So again, we have two food heroes here with us. Absolutely, and then the question would be, what made you select these two from your only six from the UK, mm. but equally, why are they so important? And we clearly agree they are. Mm. Well, if we could start with Tom, because Tom represents, to me at least, um, and, and again, that wonderful description, heavily influenced by the, the, the way he talks about Perry and Cider. But for me, Tom's work in saving Perry is actually, it's saving a drink, but it's actually saving a landscape. It's a story of trees, really, that um, some of the thing, some of the, some of the, uh, trees that um, filled our landscape for, for centuries um, were lost. Tom is somebody who believes that they shouldn't disappear. Um, so, and, and maybe Tom, tell us about the, the copy as an example of that. Uh, indeed, uh, these, th these trees in, the, in their own right are magnificent. Uh, they, they look fantastic in the landscape, uh, particularly right now, this time of year, the blossom on these trees is a beautiful white canopy. Uh, these trees are quite tall. They can, be, they can be as big as oaks, and they look very, very impressive when you see them. So they have an absolute beauty too, which really is to be, to, to be relished. Um, the, the copy is just one example of a number of varieties that were in existence at the end of the 1800s and grown uh, to be used for making perry but very quickly i think uh, usually 
because land tends to get given over to corn. It's more profitable. Uh, these peripear trees got grubbed out <clears throat> through the uh, 1900s. And so it came to be that we realized a few years ago that there was <coughs> only this one tree left, which I was lucky enough to find in an orchard. We believe there might be others, but they just haven't been found yet. Um, so uh, you know, this, 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 is, this is the situation we're at with uh, something as simple as the humble pear tree, peri pear tree. I would be curious, how do you find trees? What, what's the search <laughs> process? Uh, I think it depends on how uh, quick you are to realize what it is you're, you're actually picking. So uh, this particular variety coffee, I had been picking this tree for nigh on 10 years before it dawned on me that, that the, this variety was showing uh, the, it, a sort of typicality. The, the real problem you have with a lot of uh, fruits is that they can they cannot always show their their true size shape color uh, on a on a year by year basis uh, with uh, especially if they're a little bit more challenged if the growing conditions are perfect if the trees uh, feeling uh, is is under uh, some challenging conditions so the fruit doesn't always resemble the classic typical look of the fruit so it took me a long time to realize exactly what this fruit was but it is really through getting out and about uh, finding these trees whether they're in old orchards whether they're in hedgerows uh, whether they're on wild land or whatever uh, and and picking them and working through the process of identifying them again a question from an american i'm sorry i'm just ignorant um as you do that, um, you say hedge groves, you say orchards. Is there any kind of ownership issue if it's in a hedge grove? Who, who's, who owns the pears? How do you get the pears? Well, uh, there, there, there is, if, obviously, if, if they're within an enclosed area that is an obvious orchard, etc., then, yes, that land will be owned uh, almost definitely by somebody. Um, but the part of the great hunt for these varieties is that establishment of a rapport uh, with with either the landowner uh, or the local authority or whatever who owns it, because a lot of the time a conversation has to be had with them for them to understand just exactly what it is they have growing uh, on their land. And a, a lot of times people aren't aware of it. So there is a, there's a lot that could be done there. So with the whole idea of Perry, what made you get into that? It, it is, as Dan was explaining in his book, it is truly a glorious drink. It is significantly different from other drinks that are made on farms. Um, you could say that far, that uh, ciders are an agricultural drink. Um, and it has just a lovely finesse and some lovely qualities that really set it out has been really something special um it has been over the centuries uh, napoleon bonaparte indeed our greatest one of our greatest foes being an englishman described it as uh, uh, it, the english champagne it's it it can have some wonderful qualities Wonderful. Thank you. Now, we're going to taste some a little bit later. Can you tell us what to look for in the one that we're going to be tasting? Yeah. So th this particular key peri, it's a naturally sweet peri. Um, not all the sugars have been converted to alcohol. So it's a very, it's a lower alcohol, uh, beautifully sweet peri with some lovely complexity. There's always a lot of uh, citrus elements in in pears Citr citric acid is the main acid in these peri pears but you've also got tannins which bring a textural thing so you have the tannins giving you a lovely body and mouth feel which allows this lovely sweetness to sit on top of this lovely citrus acidity and so you'll get a very confectionery fruitiness uh, you'll get in the sort of bottom of it i always like to think of it as maybe hints of rhubarb uh, maybe hints of uh, a, a touch of ginger, uh, maybe a bit of gooseberry. And then in the middle of the taste, you get lots of melon. 
uh, maybe a touch of guava. And then at the higher end, you, you swing towards the more hedgerow fruit of like elderflower. And it's all very honeyed as well. So it's just, it's a delightful drink. Can I just add something as, as well, Jessica? Sure. So uh, the, music, the music background, I think, is actually <coughs> relevant. And uh, I mentioned with some of the stories, it's as, it is about genetic resources and the loss of the, the copy and the revi the, what Tom has done to bring back some of these varieties. But it, it is also about skill. And, and knowledge, and I think you can visit Tom and buy um, cider and perry direct from Tom, but there's a room at the back where there are, there's rooms of barrels, and, and Tom's great skill is in blending some of these barrels. So, Tom, would you just do me the favor of just explaining okay. <laughs> that there might okay. be a connection between your music okay. background and the, and the barrels? Indeed, Dad. So, so the, the thing is that I think when you're mixing sound, it's about balance. And it's and it's about uh, t harmony, and you want everything in its place, layered uh, appropriately, so that the the music that's being performed makes complete sense to the listener. And for me, working with with Perry and working with Cider too, it it is about the mix. It's about the blending and the layering, so that when someone takes a drink, it looks right, it smells right, and it tastes right, and in terms of the taste, that means I, I like to see things as having a shape. I, I, I think they, they just have, I like to think a warm, just round, comfortable shape where you have, it has a base, it has a middle and it has a top and it just has a lovely finish to it. So it stays in the mouth and gives you a, a lovely drinking experience. And so blending sound, blending drinks, they, they call on the same way that you should see um, both of them. They have layers and they have complexity, but ultimately they have to be incredibly listenable and incredibly drinkable. Otherwise, nobody's going to want to know. <laughs> Thank you so much. And we will be raising a toast to you and your speedy recovery Thank later this evening. Much. Thank you. Thank you. And our next gentleman, who is a compatriot, Joe Schneider. Um, who brought back a British classic. So will you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, so um, we make a, a raw milk Stilton, and I'm not even allowed to say that. That's illegal, so please don't read more about it. Uh, so the, the pot <coughs> history of this cheese is ostensibly the king of English cheese. Stilton has a very long, hundreds of years of uh, tradition of being made in, a, uh, in England in three counties, Nottinghamshire, Leicestershire, and Derbyshire. Uh, there's a, a, a town uh, of the name of Stilton, but that is actually in Cambridgeshire, but it lent its fame to the cheese because that's where all the cheese would congregate on the northern road to London, and then that's where the trade would occur, so they would bring Stilton to Stilton, and I think that's why it lent its name. But Stilton was, with some minor caveats, Stilton was uh, not really produced in Stilton. So uh, when I arrived on the scene, and I, I, moved in, I moved to Britain in 98, making cheese on small farms with raw milk, uh, and I was working with a company called Neil's Yard Dairy, who have been champions of British farmhouse cheese, British and Irish farmhouse cheese for now nigh on 40 years, 35, 40 years. Uh, and so I had a relationship with them. I was selling them cheese under different guys. And then one day, the owner, Randolph Hodgson, a very inspirational person in the world of um, the renaissance of British farmhouse raw milk cheese, took me for a pint in a pub in Borough Market and said, <laughs> I've got an idea. I want to bring back raw milk Stilton. Are you interested? And I laughed and ordered another pint, and I thought, that's funny. <laughs> we chatted about it, but it um, became apparent to me over the ensuing weeks that Randolph <coughs> was like Johnny Appleseed. He just plants a seed, walks away, and then that idea against your will starts growing. And it, it grew on me, and I thought, really? Could we do that? Uh, and I was somewhat attracted by the idea that an American might be able to resurrect this extinct cheese. <laughs> uh, so we started uh, about 16 years ago, um, 
I always, in my head, I think it's a new project, but 16 years is a long time. We found a farm in the right area to work with, and uh, we have been endeavoring to resurrect Stilton in its traditional form. So it has not been made, Stilton has not been made on a farm since the 1930s, and has not been made with raw milk since the 1980s. The very last company making it, Colston Bassett, stopped in 1989. And raw milk Stilton, which is uh, what I consider proper cheese, and I can expand on that later, but uh, it became <coughs> extinct. And that was morally repugnant to people that care about not only cheese, but food, culture, and heritage. And why was it illegal, though? Can you, I think that's an important point. Why is it saying, that term that you used, why is that uh, well, controversial? You, Jessica, you should probably ask your appropriation question because that leads no, no. <laughs> nicely into I understand because it's, it's the raw milk and the, the laws involving it, no? Yes, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Moving forward, about appropriation. <laughs> about appropriation. <coughs> I have a very long history of cultural appropriation. Uh, I started my cheese-making journey as an American living in Holland making Greek cheese for a Turk. <laughs> so I don't have any qualms about cultural appropriation. Um, the problem with uh, Stilton is that it has been improperly appropriated, and I am trying to reappropriate it. So I can't judge the crowd, but we're all here in the UK. Uh, so many of you will be British citizens. I myself am a British citizen now. I have dual citizenship. And I like that word. Citizenship is very interesting. I am not an Englishman, but I'm a British citizen. And I became one because I was committed to living here and working here and um, embracing the uh, values of what it means to be British. And I took an oath and I raised my family here and so I have a stake in that cultural heritage. And what I saw was that the tradition of raw milk farmhouse Stilton was appropriated by five companies. And if you consider yourself British, you should be ashamed or maybe horrified that somebody took your cultural heritage away from you. You no longer have the choice, it has been removed, to eat Stilton made the way it was 200 years ago, i.e on a farm, which is germane, because it's the farmer's milk. So they have control over that. All the Stilton that you buy in a supermarket is blended from farms all over those counties. It's pasteurized, homogenized, it's mucked about with, I don't, you know, maybe it's good industrial cheese, but it is not proper farmhouse cheese, and it doesn't <coughs> affect the cultural heritage of hundreds of years of Stilton making you know, in this country. So uh, it's upsetting to me that more people don't get more incensed by that loss. Uh, but that's what we were trying to do, is grapple with uh, a legislative aberration which says um, these five companies have taken your history and your heritage and said, ooh, that looks profitable. We'll have that, and we will now define what Stilton is. And they picked the nice bits, like, oh, it's blue. Um, and I'm not being facetious. You could make Stilton with a pineapple in the middle of it and still call it Stilton. But you cannot make Stilton on a farm with your own raw milk. So in the late or mid 90s, the, uh, I'm going to use this word because I love it, a cartel of uh, Stilton companies <laughs> took control of Stilton and they wrote a PDO. A PDO is a legislative instrument, protection and designation of origin. It's a European one. As you know, because we, oh, oh, that's right. Oh, we're not doing that. Sorry. Anyway, uh, let's, pat, let's skip over that. Uh, Moving right along. Anyway, uh, it's like an AOC. It's a, it was a European mechanism to recognize and identify regional, traditional foods that needed some degree of protection. 
simply put, they didn't want people in California making uh, Parmigiano Reggiano or Champagne or Brie de Meaux. So it's a, a, it's a legislative framework that says, ooh, what these people have been doing and making and growing in this area is really important, culturally and economically important to that area. We're going to protect that name so you can't use it unless you are in the right area and making it to the right recipe. And so what the Stilton makers did in the 1990s was write that legislative framework, but they snuck in a rule that it had to be made with pasteurized milk. So literally created a barrier for any small-scale farmhouse producers that wanted to make Stilton with raw milk the way it had been for the first 200 years of its history. So that's where I took issue. Uh, so we, that's why we can't call it Stilton, because we would literally be breaking the law. I'd be breaking trademark law and the, um, the PGI laws of Europe, uh, and they would sue me. They've indicated that they would sue me if I do that. So I have to <clears throat> sail close to the wind there. But um, we are endeavoring to make a raw milk Stilton, um, despite the fact that right now, legally, you're not allowed to do that. OK. Was that uh, a little bit ambivalent? No. <laughs> Uh, Not in uh, the least. <laughs> Probably a little pointed, but <laughs> fascinating. And I mean, I think the thing is so, um, well, two things. I asked Tom what to look for in the taste. What should we look for in our tasting of this, not Stilton? Uh, yeah, it, it resonates very much with what Tom was describing. That's how I, I can't be as florid as, as he was. Um, but I liked his <laughs> idea of shape. And we often, we, we often uh, use the analogy of, it's like listening to, listening to, so a pasteurized cheese, it has some attributes. And it might be like a quartet. But a raw milk cheese is like listening to a symphony. So everything is plain as it should. There are layers of sound. And it's the same with the flavor of, of a good raw milk cheese. It sort of builds up around you. One of my favorite experiences is tasting at a market, and you give somebody a piece of cheese. And you know, it's like goldfish syndrome. People see free food, and they come in and <laughs> hover, and then they wander off. But my favorite is when somebody just grabs a free piece of cheese, and he walks off. And then they stop, like 20 feet away, and then turn around and come back. And this has happened to us a lot. He said, what is that? I love that because it took them 20 feet for that flavor mm -hmm. to open up for the base layers, the creaminess, the piquancy. He's waiting for the bitter. It doesn't come. What is that flavor? Why is that still in my mouth? I'm going to turn around and find out what's happening to me. I love that. That's how you get them, huh? <laughs> yes, because it has a complexity of flavor and a, and a length and different layers. And if they're all in harmony, you know, you have the sweet creaminess of the milk, but the acidity and the sharpness of the blue, which shouldn't overpower it. And they should all marry in your mouth and then stay there. Whereas um, a, a pasteurized cheese, if you try it at home, next, you, I'm sure you have some in your fridge, just eat it. The flavor's there. And it might be big and punchy, like an American cheese. We don't say it's strong. We say it's sharp. Right, mm. sharp cheddar. Mm -hmm. It's just acid. That's all you get is that one-dimensional flavor, but it confuses you. It's like sweet or MSG. It's just, wow, something, my taste buds have been activated. That's acid. That must be delicious. But then the flavor just drops off, whereas raw milk cheese offers that sort of length of flavor that stays with you for minutes after you've eaten it. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So we will look for that as we go forth tonight. I look forward to the combining of the two as well is going to be very interesting. So we'll have to have some orchestration and some discussion about that as well. Um, I think it may be time to throw some questions to the audience or to ask for questions from the audience. Anyone? Yes. There are microphones that will appear miraculously. Oh, yes. <laughs> Hi. Um, fascinating. Lovely to hear you all talking. Um, I wanted to ask you, Dan, your brilliant book, it, which is very sobering, but do you see any glimpses of hope, you know, given that we now know so much about genes and, you know, this message which seems so clear mm. that it's really important to save biodiversity, are you seeing things happen? Are, are people understanding how important this is? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think um, 
e even the fact that we use that word biodiversity, which I don't think people were using, uh, or certainly mainstream conversations didn't really feature biodiversity. And I think we're waking up to the fact that, that it, it's the loss of biodiversity and in the case of eating to extinction, agrobiodiversity is really important. And it is being reflected in significant work that's happening around the world. So in the book, uh, and also I've made radio programs about this, the work at Kew, for example, in the way they're, they're researching the future of coffee and you know, they have found in, in the same way that Tom was describing, finding these lost uh, peri pear trees, you know, some of these uh, endangered um, species of coffee that we will need for the future because climatic conditions mean that Arabica and Robusta are going to be increasingly vulnerable in the future. So the fact that Aaron Davis, one of the great coffee experts of the world, helped to track down in Sierra Leone um, a couple of um, pairs of stenophylla, uh, uh, some uh, stenophylla uh, plants that were thought to have been extinct in the 1950s, it could be that they will contribute to the future of coffee. And that is lots of uh, resources <coughs> being invested by, I mean, it, it's interesting that, that the UK government for many years has helped make that possible. Q itself, a, a globally respected organization. And I think if you take a close look at what's happening around the world, um, scientists are increasingly turning Vavilov's concerns into actually practical work. So wheat is being revisited and a lot of the wild um, ancestors of wheat from the Fertile Crescent are now being used in breeding programs. Um, but obviously that's just the genetic story. I think obviously we need to, it, it, the bigger challenge is, is the food system that means that we have access to and that we are informed to make better decisions about you know, what we are buying and eating. And the fact that billions and billions of pounds of subsidies that underpin the current system can be used in, in more uh, beneficial ways for us and for the, for the planet. And I think the Green Revolution is an example in the 20th century of how the food system was fundamentally changed. And if we can do it then, we can do it again. Hmm. Yes. Um, something for Dan. Um, oh, well, let's go back to Oaxaca mm. and the corn and <coughs> many varieties of corn that have been grown in Mexico and the arrival of the GM foods mm. that kind of knocked out so many of the indigenous ones. The Mexican government, as I'm sure you've just seen, has just outlawed GM foods. Do you think we're actually going to be changing back? to looking more seriously at what we've lost? Do you think that's a good sign? Mm. I, um, and I think that, that will help. I think the, the challenge is uh, huge amounts of diversity still exists in Mexico, and there are still farmers who are, who are saving um, maize diversity and, and also some of the, um, uh, you know, the crop trust, for example, is doing a huge amounts of work to, to try and document and save this uh, maize diversity, but again, it's the it's the it's the system um, of of the um, you know, post green revolution uh, economics and science and technology. So, for example, um, at the beginning of the 20th century is when F1 hybrids were first developed and they were quickly applied to maize. So, again, as as with borlog and wheat, they they created this really high yielding productive maize so productive that we ended up with the you know the corn belt in the states and then we ended up with the trade mechanism of nafta which meant that <coughs> this is such a i mean it's so important to reflect on this that the country that where maize was domesticated started to receive this influx of homogenous high yielding corn belt uh, you know maize from the states again, because of subsidies. And it did overwhelm uh, a lot of indigenous farmers, but, and it wasn't, the, it wasn't maize they could even eat. It was, it was turned into, you know, it's the high fructi fructose corn syrup, and it was turned into you know, sweet sugary drinks that then you know, turned 
Mexico into one of the most obese populations in the world. So unless you fix the economics and support those farmers who are saving that diversity, then um, you know, uh, it's hard to see um, you know, how, how um, we can avoid a lot more diversity being lost. But you know, there are chefs, high profile chefs in Mexico who are working directly with farmers and giving them um, you know, high returns on what they grow. But that's just the chef and you know, a, a small community of farmers. Again, it's, I think it's going back to these big structural issues of subsidies and government policy and the fact that um, we are waking up to the idea that we need a post um, you know, fossil fuel based farming system. So change has to happen. Uh, and we, we, <laughs> we have the science and the understanding of why diversity matters. It's just that we need the political will. Yeah. Mm. Okay, in the back. Hi, right, so you, earlier you talked about um, <clears throat> um, you got to eat it to save it. So as end consumers, we're given the kind of product by supermarkets, right? So there's a bit of a, a cycle where we can only eat what they provide to, to an extent. Are there anything that the, the whole panel would recommend to the end consumer who, you know, access would be a limiting factor, could recommend for, you know, living that principle of eating, you know, eating to save it, basically, because, you know, I get a little on every week and I buy my shopping and what we buy our odd box or whatever, and we do our best, but that's still only what they can provide because that's what they are giving us no matter what mm -hmm. we do. Are there things that you know, recommend, provide, can suggest that... Um, people, others can kind of kind of do. do you want to, or Tom, thank you. Thank you. Um, Tom, um, <clears throat> uh, I I have to be honest. Um, it, it's unlikely that you'll come across um, a, a very good Perry uh, in any of the larger uh, super, supermarket outlets. Um, it's a function of very very little being made. And what is made uh, really can't sustain itself unless it's at a, a, a pretty decent price. Um, so uh, any, if I if I'm, I'll be as careful as as Joe was. I think if there's any peri that is available in the larger supermarkets, it probably isn't made from peri pears, and it really is the peri pear that I'm interested in. Uh, finding, saving, and propagating. And I think part of the question becomes how you shop, where you shop, what you put your money for, and then there's the other side of that. What can you afford to buy? Mm. And you have to get all of those sort of working in some kind of symbiotic harmony because you may be well-meaning, well-intentioned, but if the only thing you've got is, you know, the supermarket on the corner, let's leave it nameless, um, that's what you've got. And there are certain kinds of social realities that become a part of this as well. And so one of the questions I was going to ask is the question of how elitist is this? You know, how do we get this to come to everybody? And I don't know the answer, but I'll throw it to you. Maybe you do. Um, Can I yes, I, I, don't, I don't know the answer. All, all, all I know is that as, as an individual producer, I do think you have a responsibility to, to make what you uh, produce accessible to as many people as possible. And of course, it would come back to the old traditional way of uh, sales from a farm, farm gate sales, so that somebody can come to uh, our shop on the farm during its opening hours, and uh, we can sell them uh, perry. We, we, can, we can sell them perry uh, that will um, into a container that they can bring. Uh, so that does away with any packaging, and it's uh, it's the cheapest way of 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 buying it. So it, it, that makes it as accessible as it's going to get. But of course, that involves a motor car and getting to the farm, and um, <coughs> it, it it's 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 going to be a struggle. Yeah, 
Can I just, because what frustrated me about so much of this over, uh, over the years of making programs and, and thinking about this is I wanted, so the book is based around some specific stories and I think that that's really what we need to illustrate what is possible. And I think um, if I just can give you some examples. So uh, there was a, a, a rice farmer in um, uh, Sichuan province who was the last farmer for, for miles and miles around to be saving um, some, uh, some of his traditional rices so that the weren't the government sanctioned types of rice. And I was thinking, where, how is he, how is he surviving on this rice? I, mean, there's, I can't see where the market is. And then uh, and this was a guy in his 60s, and then he just got out his phone and on this WeChat app showed me <coughs> that how he was selling his rice to people in Beijing and, and, and Chengdu. And then I, th I think um, at the city level, that's really important because I, I mentioned this example of the way in which Copenhagen have inserted diversity in some of the public procurement contracts so that the contracts that end up delivering food into schools actually have diversity um, added to them. So it's not just how cheap the apples are or how many apples you can supply, but how many varieties can you supply because they see that as having value. And as, as we are increasingly aware, cheap food isn't really cheap you know, in terms of true cost accounting of its impact on the planet and on our health as well. Um, and then uh, just that point about um, people you know, who might be marginalised and this, some of this food you might argue is completely out of reach. Well, Scotland the Bread is an initiative in which they are growing traditional land race wheats in Scotland. They, they've got their own small mill and then that flour is going out to community bakeries and reaching people who would be just getting um, sliced white loaves from food banks, but they are actually getting that food into communities that really need it. So I think with imagination, vision, and actually technology, that this, this can slowly happen while we wait for the big political decisions and the inevitable changes <coughs> we need to make because of our diminishing resources. Okay. Other, yes. Um, hi, this is a question for Dan. Um, Thinking about the book that you had written and all these places that you had visited and looking at the traditional ways of farming, um, do you think there's a direct link in keeping those traditions and preserving these seeds and all the foods that have gone into extinction? Uh, and in that sense, uh, do you think that diversity and tradition can work along each other to preserve these seeds, to preserve these traditional ways of growing this food that seems to be going out of extinction, basically. I mean, I think we've, uh, again, as, as humans, we, we, we often make this mistake of thinking <coughs> scientific breakthroughs are all we need, and these techno fixes that, that happened, whether, you know, whether it's the roller mill in the 19th century or the, you know, the green revolution in the 20th century. And I think um, I, I, I mentioned this physicist in the introduction of the book, Barabasi, who talks about this reductionist approach we've had to science for too long, and that we haven't seen the interplay between the way we farm and the impact on biodiversity and then the knock-on effects and the risks. Um, so I think you know, this simplification um, of processes and just seeing these scientific breakthroughs as, the, uh, you know, as, as a solution, um, and then it starts to impact on us in, in many kind of, un, you know, in many different ways. So I think, um, again, we're becoming aware of the interconnectedness of things and actually realising that what was dismissed as a traditional or, you know, in some people's uh, terms would be a, a, a backward or a primitive way of producing food actually is far more sophisticated and complex than we've, we realised and it deserves to be researched and invested in. Thank you. I believe we have a question here. Yep, there's a question that's come in um, online from Claire, and she said, um, Joe has talked about how PDO's being co-opted, I suppose, by special interests. Are PDO's, I think this is a question for any of you, are PDO's part of the solution or part of the problem? Could they be used as part of the solution? Ooh, you <laughs> may have gleaned that I'm not a big fan of the PDO system. 
<coughs> I think it's fairly valueless at the moment. There are um, accreditations or recognition that we get that mean a lot more to me, and slow food is one of them. To have that community of people point at you and say what you're doing is important means a lot more to me than a PDO would. Uh, having said that, um, you could fix it. You could fix it, and that would take political will. And uh, we came up against that when you know I applied to have that PDO changed, but our government was not interested. I had the misfortune of going. I went over George Eustace's head. I went straight to the European Commission and got a meeting with DG Agriculture the day after Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of stony faces, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's been co-opted and it's been lobbied by people that want to control that for commercial reasons. Um, market share, not about preserving um, traditions for people or the, or the people involved or the people eating that food, the people involved in making it. So you, I have no faith in the PDO system as it stands. When I see the, the label, you know, that little star thing, it, it means nothing to me. It indicates nothing no integrity or anything special about the food. But that could be changed if governments um, took some interest in it and vetted those applications and said, hey, what, what does pasteurization have to do with traditional cheese making? I don't think that should be in there. But until you have that will, it will be a meaningless label. Mm. And your thoughts, Tom? Um, I, I will marginally disagree with Joe there only because with the wonderful uh, arrival of Brexit uh, we no longer can use uh, PGI and PDO in the, in the European uh, use of it so that, uh, that, that labelling now it, it isn't used here we have our own version of it and it is a, a very good opportunity for us to change that uh, but I don't think it's been seized. We've adopted en masse uh, the, the situation as it was when we were still in Europe. But I do think in terms of the, the, that labelling for the rest of Europe, th that it does hold up in many, many cases. And there are some uh, uh, tremendous uh, growers, uh, cheesemakers, winemakers, cider makers in the rest of Europe that use PGO and PGI, and uh, for me, it does have validity. Uh, but within the UK, yes, he is 100% right. Uh, I am a member, or yes, of a PGI that was hijacked by uh, Big Cider and was a reflection of the necessities for that company uh, rather than the values that Cider and Perry should have uh, itself okay interesting interesting mm -hmm. yes in the middle of the about the fifth row back young lady they're coming at you from both sides <laughs> right. um, so from the discussion it seems that maybe the industrial level of farming that contributes to the extinction of food and I um, and I watched on a documentary about that, like more than half of the food that's in that's in the industrial farming are going to the animal like <coughs> agriculture uh, as like feed. Um, so do you think that animal like ag do you think that animal like agriculture could be one of the drivers of the of the extinction of uh, of the more traditional food food? You want to? No. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, I, I think there are some very clear examples of the way in which, uh, again, going back to that 20th century breakthrough of producing huge amounts of grain, so much so that we ended up feeding it to animals or using it for fuel, um, shows the, how distorted the system became. Um, and obviously, deforestation and the cultivation of soy um, and monocultures of palm as well for production of oil as well um, so I, yeah so I, I, th I think it isn't just about animals and livestock it's about how we have 
created um, a cheap meat system, supposedly cheap cheap meats. Whereas in the in the book, I'm trying to get across the idea that there are again these intricate, sophisticated ways in which livestock have been part uh, has um, have been part of um, uh, you know, food systems for thousands of years. So take, for example, the, the example of... Um, so I write about pigs, <coughs> the domestication of, of, of pigs, and also if you think about the way in which um, ruminants as well play a role and the cycle of fertility as well. So there are, you know, there are systems in which we use livestock that, are, that can be beneficial to um, farming systems. But I think it's when we unpick that system and then... Um, you know, took the animals and put them into intensive systems and then started to produce crops to feed the animals. Um, so again, uh, there are lots of uh, extremely sophisticated, complex uh, systems, in, in, invol including animals, that, that we could um, draw on <coughs> in a world in which fossil fuels being used for fertilizers, deforestation to produce soy for, to feed pigs. You know, it, it's becoming increasingly apparent that that is something that we cannot continue. But there are ways in which we can integrate livestock into systems that are beneficial. On the end? Well, on the end and then... Hi. Hi. Um, this is a question for Dan and it's quite personal. Um, I think <coughs> it's our journey in terms of discovering um, all these stories and foodstuffs. Um, what stands out as being particularly yummy that you've come across that you've really enjoyed eating? Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> I think uh, I mean, th that lentil was, was really interesting. Uh, and again, it's because I think it's the same way in which that the Kaval Jar wheat in, in Eastern Turkey you know, ha had its own identity in terms of flavor and the way that was used in meals. Um, this was an exceptional, <laughs> not many uh, times you get to say this in a sentence, an exceptional lentil. <laughs> in that, you know, um, and, you know, its texture and its flavor, and, it, and again, it made me realize that there is huge amounts of diversity that most of us never get to experience um, that can completely change your perception, your view of, of some of the foods that perhaps we don't have in our diets, but actually it is about the particular varieties or types of foods. Likewise with, you know, um, the Ugandan banana. I mean, I, I, I drank some <coughs> of the beer brewed from some of these endangered bananas in Uganda and, in, in fact, a, a type of gin as well. And, you know, again, just opened my mind beyond what, what my daily experience or encounter might be with a, with a banana. So I think... Yeah, something as humble as the uh, Swabian lentil, but also there's another story which is uh, from southwestern Colorado, and um, I spent some time with a um, Native American former chef, Carlos Baca, who took me into these forests and gave me um, something called bear root, and it, it's been used uh, by people as everything from an insecticide to um, relieving um, coughs, to being a flavor, in his case, with blue, blue corn um, is a childhood uh, flavor. But it's, again, it's just the, I think it was the power, <laughs> this medicinal property that it had, but also being there and, and being told this story of what it meant to him and the history it revealed of what had been lost through um, colonialization. Uh, so I think it's the power of a story in combination with these flavors, really. That, um, and again, that's what food is. It's that combination. It, it, it is. You know, it's not just about the genetic resources, and you know we should be worried about food security. It, it's about identity and culture, and the fact that humans have been so ingenious to create this huge diversity over thousands of years. That's that's my inheritance. It's your inheritance, in the form of seeds and livestock breeds that are, are disappearing. And the way Joe was talking about, I mean. It, that <laughs> every time I hear Joe talking about talking about cheese that way, and actually that's our cheese and that's our food history. Um, so I think that, yeah, the power of of the story with the with the flavour kind of yeah, it amplifies the experience. Yeah. 
So yeah, lentils and uh, lentils and bear root. I don't know if they go together, but yeah. <laughs> they might. We've got somebody who's got the mic and someone who wants it. So yes, I know. <laughs> Sorry to bring you back to the more serious question of this food systems, but Dan, I was going to ask you. A lot of brands are now investing in the idea of, uh, of regen regenerative mm. agriculture. How successful do you think that's going to be in kind of bringing back biodiversity? Um, mm. I think what's actually happening is that uh, a lot of the big I mean, I'm talking about the, the major global companies <coughs> want to change, but struggle to change. I think they are locked into a system. So what, what's increasingly happening is they're buying up small, <coughs> small companies. And in some cases, not all cases, but in some cases, investing in them, supporting them uh, to enable them to scale up. Um, so that's an interesting um, trend to watch. Um, but also, I, th I think um, it really needs to happen on a major scale. So I think the, the, the example of India and the way in which when the, um, the, the, the influence of um, British botanists arriving in the 19th century and displacing a lot of indigenous crops with mostly British bred wheats uh, and also expanding rice cultivation, it turns out that you know, when scientists have looked at what India really needs for its future food, it's millets. Um, so these tiny, um, you know, these tiny grains that, that and had huge amounts of diversity. Um, but because uh, India became a, um, you know, this, this rice and wheat boom that was created by external uh, influences, they lost so much of that. But it turns out if you if you made calculations when, when it comes to water usage, uh, nutrient deficiency, <coughs> soil, use of energy, millets wins over. And one of the reasons it fell out of favor is because they're, they're difficult to process, uh, to, 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 to mill. But we now have the technology to make that happen. Um, and so I think on, on a big scale, um, bringing benefits, you know, environmental benefits, but also health benefits, um, yeah, the evidence is building and growing that, that what went before actually can play a part in the future. Yeah. <coughs> yes. I think that, well, this and then last, last question. So, please. Hello. Oh. Hi, Joe. This is a question for you. I'm over here. Hello. <laughs> um, it's a sort of cheese-specific question. I wanted your advice as a cheese maker because... I'm really interested in trying to make my own cheese at home, um, but I'm finding two sort of main barriers. One is that there doesn't seem to be an obvious route to sort of go somewhere and learn how to make cheese. There, there just doesn't really <coughs> seem to be like com many comprehensive cheese courses. And the second one is you sort of um, were singing the praises of raw milk in cheeses, which I would love to try, but it seems to be quite hard to get hold of. You know, as someone who lives in southwest London, where does one find raw milk? Do I need to get some goats? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, you can get raw milk. Um, and probably in London, there are people selling it. You know, Lincolnshire Poacher sells bottles of raw milk. If you're talking about like a little stovetop exercise. You, you could go to a market and, and look for raw milk. There are a lot of um, cheesemaker farmers who come into London with, with raw milk that you could take away. Uh, or you could find a local farm and just drive up and see if they'll sell you some. We sell raw milk on our farm uh, through a machine. So that is something with a little bit of uh, investigation you could do. Um, as for cheese making courses, I have some sympathy for you, uh, because when I started, there was nothing. They had sort of industrialized um, cheese making courses. And I love this subject because it, it kind of gets to the root of how you transfer knowledge from one generation to the next in terms of cheese making. So I was desperate and hungry for knowledge. <coughs> how do I participate in this um, craft? How do I become good at it? And um, I couldn't find that path. And it's gotten better now. There are some very good cheese courses. It's going to sound like a plug, but where we make cheese is in Nottinghamshire on the Welbeck Estate. We have a school called the School of Artisan Food. 
uh, and it runs uh, some cheese making courses at a very basic level or at a sort of professional development level. So they are out there, but they're, they're thin on the ground. So mm. I do sympathize with you. Okay. And then this person, yes. Um, d d this is a question for, for, for Dan and Joe, really. Mm. You both mentioned the need for political will. How do we get it? Yeah, uh, I think. <laughs> a, well, because um, short term electoral cycles obviously are not uh, conducive to big systemic change. And we, we have the national, we're waiting to see what happens with the national food strategy and the white paper that will be produced from that. And it's been delayed and delayed. Um, you know, and obviously, you know, contemporary events mean means that we're distracted and, and thinking about I issues elsewhere in the world. But I think a, a really interesting thing that's happening behind the scenes, really, is, is thinking about the, um, the investor networks that are hugely influential and controlling trillions and trillions of, of pounds. So the kind of institutions that are thinking about where are, you know, if you're, if you're lucky enough to have a pension, you know, where those pension funds are, and actually, that money is moving away from what is now considered to be the more risky uh, intensive systems where in a few years' time it could be that they are you know, the target of government regulation um, for health reasons. You know, there could be more sugar taxes or there could be uh, disease outbreaks from livestock that create huge um, costs <coughs> of litigation. That money is, is moving into, in, into interesting places and it's, it's, it is hugely influential. Um, and so I think, yeah, politics will um, take its own course and certainly will have to respond to the unavoidable, which is that there is a finite amount of fossil fuels that will produce fertiliser in that system and populations will become increasingly sick because of the food system. And so, the, you know, these predictions that there's going to be more invested um, within the NHS on type 2 diabetes than cancer... Um, so I think there's a political reality that cannot be avoided. So I think it's going to be interesting um, to watch. I, I, I don't know what to expect from this white paper uh, more than anyone else. But I think follow the money and actually see where uh, huge amounts of um, capital is shifting towards some um, quite innovative uh, ways of producing food for the future. So I'm optimistic because we have to change. It has to happen. There's no, there is no way of avoiding change. Um, but again, we don't want to just repeat the same mistakes from the past and have another kind of green revolution type exercise where we end up with you know, new forms of monocultures. Um, yeah. I'm more cynical. You may have picked up on that already. <laughs> <laughs> I think the poli and, and my focus is much more narrow. It's just about cheese and my experience with it. But, uh, <coughs> <laughs> the political will. Oh, and there was a gentleman who asked earlier, like, how do I, how do I find these things? How do I, how do I know what to eat? And if I go to my supermarket, and I just get bombarded with indifferent food and cheese. And when I moved to Britain, I didn't even know that Parmigiano Reggiano didn't come in a little green can. I'm sorry, that's true. So I went on my own journey. And anybody who's paid attention to American politics over the last five years may have come to the conclusion that democracy is dead or mortally wounded. Uh, so I think your only form of democracy and political will is where you spend your pound. So if you walk into a shop like Neil's Yard Dairy and you take the time to learn and explore and go on a quest, I've got to change how I eat and, and shop and what I care about. And I, I want a different kind of connection. And if you do that, um, skirting issues of elitism and uh, you know, you're going to have to pay for that but you're buying into something that, so we're too small for government to, to notice or care about. So if more people buy our kind of cheese, again, very narrow focus, and more farms can make a living making this kind of cheese and more people get pleasure, nobody's mentioned that word yet. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. the flavor. The lentils. It, it's human, <laughs> right? You love the, it gave you pleasure. That's why we eat good mm. food. And you sit at a table with people you love and you eat food that, uh, amazes you and that's pleasurable, that's what we want. And if more people do that, 
then we become a group that can't be ignored. And then there's all sorts of fallouts of people making good food. Then there's downward pressure for their producers and farmers to produce in a better way. That's the political will that I'm looking for, mm. sort of more grassroots. But at the same time, I don't think we should be beating ourselves up as individuals saying it's, it's all down to us. Because I think there is a, the, the reality is there is only so much we can change as well, individuals. I, mean, I, I think, think the, that may be a good place to leave it. It's all down to us. <laughs> so I want to say thank you, Tom. But I also want to ask both of you, where does one obtain? Where does one get your peri? Where does one get your cheese? Um, well, if you're in London, you could go to Neil's Yard Dairy at uh, Borough Market or Covent Garden. Okay. Or by Haven't online. done that. We'll, we'll look. Very good. Okay. And as far as I go, um, you could go to the London Cider House in Borough Market, or you can get it from Fine Cider. Uh, they do a wonderful online and distribution job. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And we know that you can get Dan's book downstairs. <laughs> so yeah. there would be that. Thank you, gentlemen, so very much for a very informative discussion. Thank you. What a fabulous, wonderful discussion. I think we can all get behind Eat It to Save It. Um, just want to thank you all, Dan. I want to thank you from all of us for writing that book, which is such an important book and such a readable book and a book I think that's going to be so influential. I want to thank Joe and I want to thank Tom for saving our tradition, Cheese and uh, Stitchelton and Perry, incredibly important. And I want to thank you, Jessica, for all the work that you do and for doing us the great honor of being part of the British Library food season just, you know, my work here is done, as far as I'm concerned. It's amazing to have you, so thank you so much. So please can everyone thank this amazing panel. Um, okay. I, I'm not gonna get between. Thank you.